It is my honor to introduce our contest Toastmaster, Nancy Deepsa. She joined Toastmasters eight years ago, and since then she's become a professional speaker. Last time this year, she became our 2016 International Speech Champion and went on to represent District 30 in Washington, D.C. Please help me welcome Nancy Deepsa. Regent 
Sleep Mar Web and Connect. Next door. Past Regional Advisor, Don Nitta. District 30 Past District Governors. Again, Michelle Cable. Joe Moore. Patricia Mark. Number eight, Laura Blanchard. 
number nine, Matthew Culp. Number nine, Matthew Culp. Now the way it's going to work is I will say contestant number one, I will give their name. I will say the title of their speech, the title of their speech, and then their name. Let the contest begin!
One morning I woke up and I heard James Brown on the radio for the first time. This is a guy who combined horns with rock music. And I knew that this was the sound that could push us over the top. So I called up a couple of my nerd friends from the high school marching band. <laughs> I recruited a trumpet player, a trombone player, and we began to learn songs from James Brown, Chicago, and the greatest horn song of them all, Vehicle by the Iron So March. <laughs> On the day of the contest, we were ready. Of the eight bands that entered, ours was selected for the last. So, after having to wait around and listen to seven versions of Louie Louie, seven versions of Jumpin' Jack Flash, seven versions of Linda Gotten the Vita Baby, we walked on stage. And as I looked up into the audience, I noticed that nobody was paying attention. They were all talking to their friends. And, uh, oh, I'm kidding. I'm no rock star. Just a nerve. <laughs> then the drummer started. One, two, three, four, and the horns kicked in. Da 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 da. And I started singing. I'm a friendly stranger in the black sedan. What happened inside my car? Everyone in the audience stopped what they were doing. He turned around and began to stare at us as if we were aliens from another planet. <laughs> I knew that Einstein's theory of relativity was true because on that day, those 15 minutes on stage felt like 15 seconds when our last notes flew out of our speakers and slammed into people's ears. We walked off stage to a standing ovation. <laughs> As I was putting my bass guitar back into its case, I felt the presence of someone staring. I looked up. There was Kathy Instow, the salad girl. And she looked so beautiful. And for the first time ever, she spoke to me and said, John, the band sounds great. I'm having a party Saturday night. Do you want to come? <laughs> that I realized that I was respected. I was admired. And I was cool. <laughs> and so my fellow Toastmasters and guests, if you ever feel insecure, just remember,
two, Sean McPartland, Irish Lobsters. Irish Lobsters, Sean McPartland. A young man walking down the seashore in Ireland. As he looks ahead, he sees a man approaching him, carrying two buckets. Now, as he gets a little closer, he realizes there's something in the buckets. So he asks the man, what do you have there? The guy says, oh, I have some lobsters. He said, lobsters? He said, aren't you afraid, you know, if you don't have lids or put covers on or anything, that they're just going to crawl out and get away? He said, no, I'm sorry. Uh, these are Irish lobsters. <laughs> he says, Irish lobsters? I said, yeah. When one tries to crawl out, the others just pull them back in. <laughs> Thank you, Mrs. Contest Chair, fellow Toastmasters and guests. Do you have some Irish lobsters in your life? Perhaps at work, or maybe in your friend group, or maybe even at home. I'd like everyone to take a moment here and ask yourself, Am I an Irish lobster? <laughs> when a friend at work stands up and says, I'm going to go for that promotion, do you support him or do you pull him back in? When a good friend of yours comes up with a new business idea or a new, new job opportunity, do you, do you give him advice? Do you encourage him or do you kind of pull him back down into your bucket? See, I think we're going to have a very small handful of opportunities in our life that we'll look back and the outcome of those opportunities will greatly impact where we end up in life. I had such an opportunity a number of years ago. I was a carpenter working for a construction company and this company had seven or eight different carpenter crews and I was one of the newer guys on one of the lower crews. I was actually getting coffee for the guys at break. <laughs> I was excited to hear that the company announced they were going to interview carpenters to fill one superintendent position, which gave you an opportunity to go out of the carpenter bucket and into a management bucket. What amazed me when I found out I was going to be a candidate is that everyone else, all these other carpenters knew exactly who was interviewing and when. So when a guy walked back onto the job after that interview, you saw it. You don't want that job. You've got to work long hours. You've got to deal with people. <laughs> now, my own father, who has worked as a subcontractor for that company for years, saw many guys come and go in that position. And he said to me, they will eat you alive. So like most of us, when our parents give us advice, we ponder, and I interviewed, and I got the job. <laughs> now, I worked for that company for five years. I then jumped out of that bucket and jumped into another bucket and started my own business. And this year marks my 20th year in business. <laughs> biggest fan is? My father. He was just trying to protect me. But don't let anyone determine what your value in life is going to be. You see, we're all going to end up in the same spot. All we're going to have to tell our story is a simple headstone. And there's not a lot of information on headstones. There's a born date, there's a died date. And those two dates are separated by a simple dash. And if that's going to tell your story, do you want that dash to be perfectly polished? To be just out of the box, never been used? Or do you want that dash to be nicked up and dinged up and scuffed up and twisted and bent and crooked? Do you want that dash to reflect your peaks and your valleys and your valleys? You want that thing to be so mangled and worn that when someone looks at your headstone, they say, that person lived a life. 
Again, don't let anyone determine what your value is in this world. Don't let anyone determine what your ultimate potential is and should be. As parents, isn't that all we want out of our kids is for them to realize their full potential? Isn't that all we should be striving for? If you find yourself in a bucket in life where you no longer hope, where you no longer find joy, and where you no longer dream, find a way to reach up as high as you can, clip those claws to the rim of that bucket, and get out of that bucket! Get out of that bucket! Get out of that bucket before you kick the bucket! This is contest trail! Okay, can we please have one minute of silence? Speaker number three, Stacia Hobson. Is showing up good enough? Is showing up good enough, Stacia Hobson?
until the reality of being boss hit me. It was leaked from the inner sanctum of the break room that I was known as the BD. Unfortunately, I don't think they meant blonde bombshell. <laughs> Regardless of what my employees thought, I was concerned for their welfare. With the recession upon us, I was scared. I mean, really scared. I had no clue how I was going to keep 26 people employed. Have you ever feared being laid off in the middle of a recession? Yeah, I get that totally. As a business owner, recessions test your strength, stamina, and stability. The problem before me was how do you save the mothership and all its passengers at the same time? Prior to recession, I had hired business coach Teresa. Honestly, I didn't think much of, this, of Teresa as a coach until the recession. One day, I showed up complaining about how bad business was due to the economy. Okay, I was actually whining. <laughs> I was loud. <laughs> you know, come to think of it, I probably sounded something like this. Incredible success. Um, 
Contestant number four, Carl Johnson. What Sigmund said. What Sigmund said, Carl Johnson. Thank you, Madam Contest Master. Welcome, my fellow Toastmasters and honored guests. My speech tonight is based on the 10th speech in the Toastmasters Competent Communication Manual, the purpose of which is to inspire, emotionally move the audience to whom the speech is being given. Finding a topic that I thought would do justice to this purpose was challenging. I've listened to other speakers give speech number 10. One person talked about how he beat a drug addiction, Another described how she single-handedly raised three children. I wondered if I had an inspiring story like that to tell. I could talk about the first time I ran the Chicago Marathon. Now, there's a third story. Or I could talk about the fact that I am a 60-year-old black male. I've never been arrested. <laughs> I'm still alive. <laughs> And I've yet to have a nervous breakdown. <laughs> How did I, who grew up on the west side of Chicago with a single mother on welfare, manage that? These were two worthy speech topic ideas, but I thought I wasn't interested enough in either one of them to want to give a speech about. I searched on and eventually settled upon something that I did feel inspired to speak to you about tonight. My speech is regarding something that happened between me and my personal trainer, whom I will call Sigmund. As I said earlier, I am a 60-year-old black male. Sigmund is a 40-year-old white male. He's about 5 feet 8 inches tall and has a rugged, muscular, athletic build. <laughs> what I'm going to describe to you happened about five years ago, we were in the middle of a personal training session one Saturday morning. I was on the bench press machine and had just lifted 200 pounds for the very first time. In response to this personal best, Sigmund said to me with delight and enthusiasm in his voice, Out of boy! When he said this, I sat up. I blinked. I was surprised. I turned and I looked at him. As I looked at him, I quickly surmised he doesn't know that old black men don't like the word boy being used to them. <laughs> I said to myself, he doesn't know the negative historical antecedents of the word boy and how it has been used to keep black men inferior position in American society. I contemplated saying to him, Sit. 
man. I know you didn't mean anything by it, but please don't use the word boy to me. I don't like it. What do you think I decided to do? I said nothing to him about it, and I let his admiration of my weightlifting prowess stand. I said nothing because, well, I was well offended by his use of the word boy, I soon discovered that I was actually more pleased than offended by sickness and a boy. As a child growing up, I did not receive much in the way of praise and encouragement from my mother. Given the desperate circumstances of her own childhood, she didn't have that to give. I have received positive affirmations from many other people throughout my life, but there was something different about what Sigmund said and the way he said it that struck an emotional chord in me. I wondered why and soon discovered that it was his use of the word boy itself that caused this emotional reaction. It cut right to the heart of the matter and drove me all the way back to a childhood where I had felt neglected. That young, sedentary boy was finally getting a particular kind of recognition that he had always needed. As my training sessions with Sigmund progressed, I found myself wanting to lift more and heavier weights in order to elicit additional Anna boys from him. The word I initially took so much offense to, I now longed to hear. Sigmund obliged. Not only did he continue to say, Anna boy, he added to his repertoire by saying, That's my boy. <laughs> Ever felt lost? I mean, really. 
daily lives. Without help, without hope, without even Google Maps. <laughs> Fellow Toastmasters, yes, Madam Contest Chair. All my life, I've been an optimist. I believe that if you have faith and keep your cool, things usually work out for the best. There came a day that optimism would be put to the test. When I was in my 20s, I used to visit my family in Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, where my dad worked as a pilot. Saudi Arabia is home to one of the largest, hottest, most barren deserts on the face of the planet. So naturally, it came as a bit of a surprise when one day my dad said, Load up the car, kids. We're going on a picnic. <laughs> the place he chose for that outing was a small village called Taif. Taif was located high up in the mountains, 6,000 feet. About the only place you could go for cool breeze, beautiful green scenery. We headed out. Me, my mom, my dad, my sister. The road up to Taif was an adventure in itself. Steep, narrow, blinding, always feeling like you're going to fall off. Somehow we made it. Pulled out our picnic basket and, man, what a feast. Best chicken and rice ever. Hummus, pita bread, stuffed dates. They had this delightful Arabic pastry called Twinkies. <laughs> All too soon, it was time to head back. As we begin our descent, we quickly realized that driving conditions had changed. A cloud had descended on the mountain. And we were driving through the fog as thick as tar. As we inched our way forward, suddenly a police roadblock stopped our car. Go no further, he said. Visibility too poor. You must turn the car around. Go other direction. Go in the other direction. To go through the desert. And to go through the desert meant no street lights, no street signs, no streets. <laughs> <laughs> My mom, a major worrier, was already starting to panic. No! What have you got us into? She said to my dad. Don't worry, Mom, I said. I got a feeling. We're gonna make it. We've been driving about an hour in the sun. <coughs> we started to lose our sense of which direction home was. I reached my cell phone to call for help, and then I remembered it was 1985. <laughs> <laughs> After driving a while longer, we came across some better ones, desert nomads, camping. Using a limited Arabic, we asked them the direction to Jeddah. One of them said something that sounded like, It's the body! Up in his truck and sped up. I assumed he meant, follow me. Could have easily been, must return to library book. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless, we took a chance and followed him as he led us deeper and deeper, deeper, to the desert. At this point, my mom was totally freaking out. Where is he taking us? How do I know we can trust him? <clears throat> Don't worry, Mom, I said. We're gonna be. Just then, he stopped his truck, pointed off to the right, and sped off to the left. Oh, great, she's right. We just got talked to by a battleist. <laughs> then I realized he'd taken us to a dry river. We drove along in it, using it as a makeshift flow. We drove on and on and on. If my dad was staying home for the family's sake, my mom was a raging tornado. I'm starving and I'm thirsty. What do we have left? I checked the picnic basket. <laughs> Nothing but a few crumbs and a couple of Twinkie wrappers. <laughs> you kids ate everything, <coughs> even the last Twinkie. You know nothing, nothing about survival in the desert. <laughs> and she could say that, of course, because she was raising this harsh, desolate wasteland called Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> I 
one point I glanced down. I noticed a needle riding on me. A deathly silence shrouded the car. Don't worry. I got a feeling. We're going to make it. No response. That optimistic attitude that had my entire life. This seemed like the perfect time to pass it on. Hey, I said, a rebel. What has two thumbs and is getting out of this thing alive? <laughs> this guy! <laughs> that got a slight chuckle, kind of like tonight. <laughs> but it broke the tension, and that was priceless. Finally, dying of thirst, on the verge of running out of gas, I saw a tiny little pinpoint of light off in the distance. And then, another one. And then, and then the whole sea of them. We made it. I couldn't believe it. We made it. Fifteen minutes later, we're pulling up in front of our house. He was in a prefab condo, a company compound, in a foreign desert. But on that day, on that particular day, nothing had ever felt more like home. I learned something. My learns for Arabian days are over now. But I learned something. Through all that, I learned that when you're an optimist, there are no bad experiences, only new adventures. One day, you're going to find yourself feeling a little bit lost. But when that happens, just remember, as long as you keep a positive attitude, you're going to make it too. But just to hedge your bets, always carry a spare Twinkie. <laughs> <laughs> Speaker number six, Greg Thompson. Broke, not broken. Broke, not broken, Greg Thompson.
I enjoy some of the finer things in life. That's what success looked like for me. I had a lovely 4,000 square foot home. I drove a beautiful gold Lexus sedan. I had a great job working for an amazing company that paid me a great salary. I traveled nationally and internationally. I was on top of the world. Without well, having the time to go into great detail, that company collapsed on me. I lost my primary source of income. I thought that company would be there forever. Have you ever lost something important to you? I counted on that company for lifetime income. In the meantime, I lost everything. And I do mean everything. Except the spirit. I lost that home and moved into a tiny apartment. I sold that beautiful car and bought me a used Pinto. <laughs> At the height of my financial devastation, all of my bank accounts were closed and overdrawn. My credit cards were closed and overlimited. My cell phone got turned off. The phone company said, I bet you can hear me now. <laughs> My car insurance got canceled for non-pay. But that was okay because a few days later they repossessed my Pinto. <laughs> I was being asked to move from my apartment for not paying. The thought went through my head that instead of buying my mom a dream home, I may end up moving in with her. <laughs> On September 1st, they shut off my utilities. My mom passed away a short time after that. I never got a chance to buy that home like I said I would. And on top of everything else, I no longer have electricity or hot water. I was as close to being homeless as a man could be without being homeless. And there was some really humbling moments. Taking more jobs was humbling. Having no money to get a haircut or a shave. I did have hair then. <laughs> and at times, no money for food. I can remember standing in my living room one day. I was up on the third floor looking out the window, and I seen a homeless man sitting against the building across the street, eating a sandwich. I said, Dad, even he gets to eat today. <laughs> I know a very few experiences more humbling than being hungry. Being 34 years old and not having money to buy something to eat made me remember the words of my mother. She said, son, trouble don't last all day. I didn't realize I was broke. I'm broke. Broke described my circumstance. Broke did not define who I was as a person. I was not less than a homeless man. Less money, perhaps, but not less of a man. During that period of time, my attitude, believe it or not, never wavered. There is in each of us an indomitable spirit. And I called on that spirit, and by sheer determination, I used my obstacles to strengthen me, not weaken me. I used my obstacles as my reasons why, not my excuses of why not. For example, instead of saying, I can't succeed because I have no phone, I'm broke, and I have no car, said I must succeed because I have no phone. I'm broke and I have no car. It's January, a year and a half later, I'm back on my feet. I had a great job again and a plan B just in case. Oh yeah. How did I do it? The credit goes to my mother. It was the values that she taught me as a child. 
My mom pushed me to acquire skills. She encouraged me to never give up. And she instilled in me an unwavering faith in God to help me with my battles. That was my number one asset for overcoming obstacles. Thanks, Mom. Lessons learned along the way, baby steps are steps too. It was important for me to not let grass grow under my feet. I had to get out there with nonstop networking. I had to push myself to do what I had to do to keep from becoming complacent. Even if it means working a low-wage job, I have no pride when it comes to getting back on my feet. To live your dreams, overcoming obstacles is an absolute necessity. And remember, broke is your circumstance, not your identity. Extend your vision to however long it takes and let no obstacle stand between you and your God-given right to live your dreams. As moms always say, trouble don't last, always. Speaker number seven, Sid Chere, Better Start Running. Better Start Running, Sid Chere. There are three simple rules for always succeeding in life. Unfortunately, nobody knows what they are. <laughs> it's probably because nobody always wins. Madam Toastmaster, fellow Toastmasters, welcome guests and judges. I cannot tell you the three rules for always succeeding. But I can give you three reasons for not giving up when you fail. Failure is inevitable. But don't give up, because we learn from our downfalls. Raise your hand if you have ever failed. <laughs> Come on now, don't lie. <laughs> I did too. I still remember like it was yesterday. There was something wrong with my legs. They were all shaky, and I couldn't steady them. Every time I tried taking a step, I fell. Then. A miracle happened, and I was finally able to walk. At the age of nine months old. <laughs> the fact that most of us can walk shows that if we persevere and learn from our failures, we can go to great lengths. Failures are not obstacles, but waypoints on our path to success. We have an innate ability to let failures guide our path. And when we are on that path, there are others watching our journey. And that is the second reason for not giving up. Because people are watching. Derek Redmond, a British athlete, 
was favored to win the 400 meter dash in the 1992 Olympics. He was competing in the semi-finals and started the race well. About halfway through, his hamstring snapped. He fell to the ground in pain and agony. Although this did not stop him from wanting to finish the race. Wounded and limping, he started running. His father came up to him and told him he didn't have to do this. But he replied, yes, I do. His father helped and with a torn hamstring, ran across the finish line. Since he had helped, the Olympic record states that he did not finish the race. But to the 65,000 spectators who rose to give him a standing ovation, he did. Not all of us are athletes surrounded by 65,000 spectators, but we do have people watching us compete in this game of life. Our spouses, our siblings, our kids. The size of our audience doesn't matter. To us, there may be one person, but to them, we are the whole world. They look to us for direction in life and on what to do when the storm hits. When we could not give up, we are teaching them that it's okay to put and give up. The next time we fall and decide to stay down, let's remember who's watching us. Remember, the people who watch us fall will also watch us rise and experience the taste of success. And that is the third and the foremost reason for not giving up. Because success feels incredible. When I was in my 20s, I could eat and eat and eat and not gain weight. <laughs> now, even if I look at a bag of chips, I gain a pound. Last year, I decided to start running. On the first day, I barely ran 100 feet and my heart started beating outside my chest. I couldn't breathe fast enough and I thought I would collapse. I almost on line one one. <laughs> I stopped and vowed to never run again. The next day, I woke up in terrible pain. But it wasn't physical. It was the mental agony of having given up. And that was worse than any physical distress I had ever encountered. A few days later, I pumped myself up and started a training program. In just eight small weeks, I went from hyperventilating after 100 feet to being able to run a 5K. When I finally crossed that 5K mark, the feeling of success and accomplishment washed over me like a tsunami. Success felt incredible. I ran home and ate a big bag of chips that day. <laughs> We all have been there, working on a lesson, on a project, on a relationship where the initial pain is so intense that the simple solution is to just give up. But let's remember that time where we persevered through that pain and how great success felt. That one time where we struggled with math but got an A on the test. That one time where we struggled in a relationship but are now in a happy marriage. That one time where we struggled to walk but can now run a 5K. Friends, in this game of life, we lose more than we win. But our wins will always be bigger than our losses. Remember, failing doesn't make us a failure. Giving up does. So instead of giving up, let's try to learn from every time we fail. If not for us, then for the people watching us. And we are sure to bask in the glory of success. The economist Thomas Friedman tells a story. Every morning in Africa, the lioness wakes up knowing that if she's not faster than the gazelle, she will starve to death. In the same Africa, the gazelle wakes up knowing that if she's not faster than the lioness, she will be eaten alive. The moral of the story is, today, it doesn't matter whether you are the lion or the gazelle. When the morning comes, Better start running. <laughs>
Madam Congressman. Speaker number eight, Leanne Blanchard, youthful optimism at any age. Youthful optimism at any age, Leanne Blanchard.
call on somebody who had walked these shoes. Hi, Mom. <laughs> Remember when I was eight and you took me to all of those graduate classes with you? What was it like? My mom had been a home ec teacher her entire life, but they cut all those programs. But she didn't let it stop her. Changing careers wasn't a problem to her. That was someone else's. She used it as her opportunity to reinvent herself. She used that opportunity and took it with youthful optimism. My mom's story served me well for many years, especially on the day her story became my reality. And I was offered the opportunity to reinvent myself. Not knowing what to do, I had to call on some other stories as well. Hey, Grandma. <laughs> Guess what? I just graduated college. I'm moving to another state. And I'm getting married. Oh, congratulations, Laura. I gotta tell ya, I've got some news too. I started a new job today. Left speechless, my grandma shared how proud she had been to raise six children, run the family farm and bowling business, but there was something left she had wanted to do. And at age 70, my grandma started her first job, working at a flower store, retiring at the age of 85. My grandma has 18 grandchildren. I was number five to call and share the next chapter of my life. Maturing children and aging wasn't a problem to her. It was her opportunity to participate in the family's youthful optimism. That optimism is what I believe leads my grandma with us today at age 94. You are so good with her. How much do you charge? <laughs> I wish I would have realized that day. But it's taken me a long time, a lot of stories, a lot of conversations, <laughs> and thousands of you to understand she wasn't asking for an end. She was looking for her opportunity her opportunity of youthful optimism. And if I've learned anything from those who have come before me, it is that you choose your opportunities. Opportunity is not just for the young of age, it's for the young of heart. <clears throat> What's your next opportunity? How will you make your age just a number? And how will you share your story? These opportunities lie within you. And you? And you? Madam Toastmaster.
Speaker number nine, Matthew Culp, The Space. The Space, Matthew Culp. response lies our growth 
and our freedom. Hmm. I think I have that space. And just then, Mini Cooper cuts me off and starts driving slow. And I begin to respond. Ah, oh, that's that space good old Victor was talking about. <laughs> Carry on, Mini Cooper. <laughs> I pass him down a mile down the road. I stop at my favorite coffee shop. And just then, a little girl, who's eight years old, comes running into the shop. She says, help, help, help! My father, something's happening to my father in the parking lot. I throw down my coffee and hear sirens in the horizon. I run outside with the other employees and patrons and I see a man in the middle of the parking lot leaned up against his car. He says, help a heart attack. I didn't know what to do. Just Breathe deep. Please, just breathe deep. Seconds later, paramedics push me to the side. They tend to the man. They put him on the stretcher. They assure us he's going to be okay. And they take him away. And I stood there frozen, realizing that the man was the driver of the Mini Cooper that had just caught me off less than a mile ago. I stood there frozen, thinking about all the times I had honked, not just while navigating my car. What about the things I said to my family, friends, and other loved ones as I navigated life? See, I always thought of myself as a kind person, but it turns out that when life doesn't go as planned, maybe I wasn't all that kind. And then I remembered something my father told me before he lost his fight to cancer. He said, Matthew, just take a deep breath. Be kind. Everyone is battling something. Everyone is battling something. If I could just take a deep breath and be kind, then maybe I could be the man I want to be. That day, had I honked, I could have killed him. But I found my space. Have you found your space? Madam Toastmaster.
Madam Contest Master, all of the ballots have been signed, sealed, and delivered. <laughs>
that says here that you are interested in woman and manufacturing. Can you explain that more to us? Well, being in manufacturing as a female is not a common career. And I have reached out and have been able to build a network of other females in manufacturing. And it's awesome to have, as like Toastmasters, to have a place where you can go and have camaraderie with people who get Thank you. <laughs> okay, I'm going to have you state your name, the club you belong to, your education level, how long you've been in Toastmasters. My name is Carl Johnson, and I'm with HHS, or Health and Human Services Toastmasters in Chicago. I've been with Toastmasters for two years, two months, and two weeks. <laughs> it's, wonderful. it's wonderful. And I have my CC as of uh, December of last year. You mentioned running marathons. Yes. Can you tell us what that experience was like? It's, uh, it's incredible. I think that it's probably the, maybe the, the second or third most um, wonderful thing that I have ever, ever done. It does incredible uh, things for your for your self-esteem and your ability to think that you can do you can do anything if you can run 26 point 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 two miles. Yeah, I, I if there's any way you can physically uh, do that, uh, I encourage people strongly to, to to run at least one marathon. And don't forget that point two miles. <laughs> 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 I, I, some people say 26. I say no. It's 26 point two. Thank you so much. Well, you belong to, how long you've been in Toastmasters and your education level? My name is Steve Orr. I belong to Naperville Toastmasters and also Windy City Toastmasters. I've been in Toastmasters for about 10 years. Okay. And thanks for that. It's not asking the club members, by the way. They always ask the staff. That's too hard for them. Oh, I wouldn't. I, yeah. I don't know that I can answer that one, so I'm sorry. That's good. That's good. Uh, on your sheet here, it says that you are interested in bowling. <laughs> Could you tell us more about bowling, how much you enjoy it, what you've done so far? All the things on the sheet, and that's what we do. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, it's a lot of fun. Um, I was kind of the instigator to start up a league. I'm not, I'm not good. In fact, I'm terrible. But somehow, once in a while, I get it down the lane, and we started up a bowling league on my job. And it's just fun because everybody does a lot of trash talking, maybe just a tiny bit of beer drinking involved. Oh, yeah, right. And some of the people who are the worst bowlers because it's based on handicap, there's a guy who started off getting about 70 or 80, but if you improve over the season, your handicap really helps you, and he ended up winning the league. So that was a lot of fun. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much, Steve. your name, the club you belong to, your, how long you've been at Toastmasters, and your level of education. Okay, my name is Greg Thompson, and I'm with AT&T Toastmasters and Broadview Toastmasters. Yeah. I'm also a DTM, and I've been with, I'm just going to say with at and I've been with Toastmasters since 2007. is, if I can help somebody along the way, then my living will not be in vain. But I'd like to know one of your mother's favorite quotes. <laughs> oh, my mother had plenty of them. She, one of them she used to say, Lord, deliver me from a sorry man. <laughs> Changing these up, I want to see if they're paying attention. And 
your education level? My name is Sid Cho Ray, and I'm a part of Next Step Toastmasters. Yeah. <laughs> and I've been a Toastmaster for about a year. And my education level, so interesting story about that. Uh, the people who heard my speech last year know that I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> so two weeks before the speech, or a week before the speech, I am, or my club conference, I'm looking at the rules and it says you have to complete six, and I had done five. <laughs> so I completed my sixth one a week before the club conference, so that means I completed six speeches. <laughs> Thank you. In your speech, you mentioned twice, twice, about eating chips. <laughs> Guess what he put under here under interest and hobbies? <laughs>
them, the important people for tonight. So let me get out of the way, take more pictures. <laughs> Second place. 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 Second place.
next winner, and this person will go to Vancouver. Vancouver. All right. Canada. Get your passports ready.